Thank you, ma'am, for the very kind introduction. And I do understand the pressure of time, especially on a Sunday morning at 10.30 a.m. And I'll try to keep it brief before the Lulu Mall opens at 11 a.m. <clears throat> All right. At the outset, I would like to thank the organizers uh, for this opportunity, uh, Dr. Rahman and colleagues, for having me here. And uh, over the next 20, 25 minutes, I'll try to give a perspective of some efforts that we have made in bringing gene therapy from the bench, perhaps to the bedside soon. The term gene therapy refers to the introduction of a normal copy of a gene into a patient with a genetic disorder so as to replace the missing protein function. The concept is very simple. The issue is, how do you deliver these normal copies of genes? Now, there are a variety of methods that are possible to transfer these normal copies of genes. And viruses are known to be most efficient simply because they have evolved over several thousands of years to infect specific tissues in the human body. And as a result, you can use a virus as a delivery vehicle to take your target gene into a specific tissue within the human. And that's the concept of viral vector mediated gene therapy. Again, there are different types of viral vectors that are possible. The lentiviruses, retroviruses have all been used. And uh, for the sake of this presentation, I will keep myself to the virus that I work on, which is the adeno-associated virus or AAV as we abbreviate them. This virus is very simplistic, contains two genes, the rep that encodes the, for the replication dependent functions of the virus and the cap that encodes for this icosahedral capsid. Now, the biggest advantage of using AAV as a gene therapy vector is its non-pathogenic nature. So far, no human disease has been associated with this virus. Now, what do we do? We get these wild type genes and replace with your genetic cargo of interest for the purpose of treating a human genetic disorder. So we basically use the AAV as a Trojan horse to deliver the intended cargo. There are at least 10 different serotypes of AAV that have been well described and have been used in multiple studies. And the biggest advantage of using AAV system is we have specific serotypes to infect or target specific tissues in the human body. For example, if I would like to treat a liver-based disease, then I would use AAV2 serotype or AAV8 serotype because they are highly specific, even when you administer them intravenously, because they bind to very specific cell surface receptors on the hepatocytes. Now, a majority of these serotypes have been used in multiple preclinical as well as clinical studies. And the learning from this exercise is that while in most models, typically the gene therapy is curative, when it comes to humans, there are certain drawbacks. And these relate to the long-term efficacy of the gene therapy itself once you administer. Two is the immune response that is directed against these viruses when you administer them in huge doses. And last but not least, at least in our setting, the access to these gene therapy products, which is a major issue that is coming up. So uh, this audience need, uh, does not need any introduction about hemophilia. Suffice to say, that spontaneous bleeding into the soft tissues and joints lead to various symptoms. And the good thing about hemophilia is that in terms of gene therapy, uh, the recombinant protein support in terms of prophylaxis can cost you anywhere between 70 to 80 lakhs per year. So, and then there is an issue of patient compliance walking into the clinic multiple times a week so that you keep uh, enough levels of factor eight or factor nine circulating in the human body. On the other hand, gene therapy is curative. Potentially, a single time injection of a normal copy of factor eight or factor nine gene into your patient 
can give them lifelong support for the necessary coagulation proteins. So that's the first attractiveness. The second attractiveness is it, the disease itself has a wide therapeutic index. If you can convert a spontaneous bleeder into only a post-traumatic bleeder, that gives you a lot of latitude in terms of uh, uh, therapeutic index. So many studies have been conducted for gene therapy of hemophilia, and this table basically captures some of them. And what is more interesting is the recent trials, for example, the one that has been conducted by Pfizer, and biomarin for hemophilia A or hemophilia B have reported fantastic data. So from patients with severe hemophilia, you are able to uh, convert them uh, into somebody with uh, uh, mild hemophilia here, and you have a supraphysiological levels of uh, factor eight as well in one of these studies. So this is all good, but the major problem is, as you know, just a few months back, CSL bearing and Unicure marketed the first drug, FDA approved drug for gene therapy of hemophilia. It has been successful. It guarantees uh, uh, reduced annualized beating rates in terms of patients. But the catch here is you are talking about 3.5 million US dollars for treating one patient. And that, you know, is outside the scope of many, uh, even in the developed world, unless and until it is significantly supported by the insurance system. And this is a reality, right? This is point number one. What I would like to take across is also another disease, which is a form of retinitis pigmentosa. I'll come back to both of this in terms of what we are doing. Liver congenital amaurosis is caused due to mutations in this gene, which is RPE65, ret retinal pigmental epithelium 65KDA encoding protein. And this particular uh, uh, protein product is an isomerase, an enzyme that plays a, cru a crucial role in converting all trans retinal esters to Levensis retinal, which binds then to the visual pigment and therefore is a major component of the visual phototranscription pathway. In the absence of RPE65, the esters accumulate within the innermost part of the retina, which is your RPE layer. And therefore, this gets degraded over a period of time. When this RPE layer degrades over time, it can no longer support and nourish the photoreceptors, leading to visual loss. Many clinical trials have been conducted for gene therapy of LCA2. In short, while it was effective for the first couple of years, what happened thereafter is the generation of neutralizing antibodies against the vector itself a decline in RPE65 expression, and also an intraocular inflammation basically reduce the effectiveness of gene therapy. Now, what it means is if you want to have a good gene therapy vector, whether you would like to uh, deliver it for the purpose of retinitis pigmentosa or for hemophilia, one, you need to indigenously prepare these vectors, and two, they should have improved transduction across multiple intended target tissues they should have reduced immunogenicity. And if possible, they should also have the ability to bypass pre-existing immunity. And the reason why I say this is, if we have 100 people in this room, close to 60 to 70% will be zero positive for AAV. And therefore, you cannot use a zero type uh, against which you are zero positive uh, as a mode of therapy. So that's another major impact. In addition to that, the cost, itself is a major issue, which is the point that I have highlighted already. And as you can see here, majority of the gene therapy products, the viral vectors, particularly AAV vectors, uh, uh, have been developed by universities in the West, uh, particularly University of Florida and as well as uh, UPenn. And as a result, uh, they are not available outside the scope of IP transfer for anybody to develop. So this means that we need to set up a significant investment in R&D to develop our own indigenous vectors, develop know-how and competency, and also for the purpose of trials, one needs to develop a regulatory framework. And in terms of lower and middle income countries like us, uh, this is going to be extremely crucial along with the ability or capacity to develop GMP grade materials to escalate it into patients. So this is the point that I wanted to highlight as a background. 
Now, what are we doing? We are doing our small bit, which is we are trying to study the biology of the virus, the AAV, and the host cell interactions, trying to understand what are the different steps that are detrimental for successful gene transfer. And once you identify these regulatory points which are detrimental, then you can work on strategies to overcome them. And once you overcome them, then you apply and see in specific disease models where there could be a potential therapeutic benefit. And in this context, we do different uh, use, uh, different AAV serotypes. We also test them by multiple methods using hepatic gene transfer, ocular gene transfer, so on and so forth, using very specific transgenic mouse models. So the scope of my work is strictly limited to preclinical models. Uh, I'll highlight some of this data. The first approach that we took is what is called as capsid bioengineering. And the idea here was once the virus binds to a cell surface receptor, it gets internalized and then it has to be trafficked across to the nuclear compartment. But during this process, we hypothesize that this virus is basically getting phosphorylated at specific residues on the core protein or the viral capsid. This phosphorylation serves as a trigger for ubiquitination of the viral capsid. And as you know, ubiquitinated proteins can be proteosomally degraded. And as a result, if I use 100 viral particles to target a single hepatocyte, less than 30 make it to the nucleus, 70 are degraded. And we wanted to reverse this. And how do you do this? You identify those residues that are specifically phosphorylated and ubiquitinated, mutate them, and try to see what the outcomes are. And this is what we did. We did a structural mapping of the potential residues that could be potentially phosphorylated or ubiquitinated. We call this as phosphor grounds. Once we identified these phosphor grounds, we then started modifying the amino acids in and around these phosphor grounds and studied the impact in terms of gene expression. And as a first step, you always use a reported gene. And when you use the unmodified virus, uh, I hope I can get, yeah. When you use the unmodified virus, this is the level of reported gene expression that you get in a cell line. And when you use modified viruses, you can see clearly the gene expression goes up. And these are called as the lysine mutants that we generated. And the same was tested in animal models. We did have about three to four fold increase in uh, hepatic gene expression. And uh, the good thing about this approach was Whatever we were trying to do was initially in AAV2 serotype, which is the prototype vector that is used in the uh, field. And majority of the residues that we were trying to modify were conserved across multiple AAV serotypes, which means not only can I target those residues which are beneficial for gene therapy to the liver, but I can also work on uh, other serotypes uh, which share the same amino acid residue or for phosphodegron residues. Long story short, we identified several from AAV8 serotype, and this is important. I'll tell you why. Uh, you can clearly see that this is intravenous administration of the vector in mouse containing luciferase as the gene. And this is the level of luciferase expression that you see after two to and five weeks with uh, unmodified vectors. And you clearly see there is a two to three fold increase in hepatic gene transfer after this time point. And then we collaborated with Dr. Amit Natwani, who was the first one to introduce gene therapy for hemophilia B, now almost a decade back. We got those vectors that uh, they used in their preclinical models. And using this AV8 serotype, this is the level of factor IX expression that we could get. And we were able to get at least two-fold increase uh, factor IX expression with the new capsids that we had developed then. Is this the story? No. You, these viruses are typically prepared in cell lines, and these cell lines are of human origin. And when the viruses are packaged in a human cell, then it is likely to acquire those post-translational modifications that a human protein would undergo. Again, we have worked on a plethora of technologies here. Suffice to say that we worked on other post-translational modifications other than phosphorylation and ubiquitination, which is nedylation and sumoylation. And again, I'll skip data here. We have tested these in hemophilia B mouse models. And I can tell you that we start seeing supraphysiological levels of factor IX expression when you use this improved vector systems. And one of the key uh, requirement of any new gene therapy vector that you develop, it has to be non-immunogenic 
and uh, basically in terms of the CD8 mediated T cell response and other assays that we have performed, they seem to be non-immunogenic compared to the wild type vectors. To summarize this part of the work, we have developed improve, improved uh, gene delivery vector systems based on AAV platform for potential gene therapy of hemophilia. And this is uh, undergoing currently rigorous uh, experiments so that we can scale it up to a level of a clinical trial. I'm going to switch gears and talk about something that you all uh, uh, identify uh, with, particularly the hematopathologist, is uh, hemophilic arthropathy. Again, this uh, audience does not require an introduction of hemophilic arthropathy. We know that there is only supportive care. What was not known is the molecular mediators which result in initially synovitis to up to the development of uh, arthropathy, which is the loss of articular cartilage. And of course, human samples are not available. You cannot test them. So we use most models to understand this phenomenon. And how did we do this? Uh, hemophilia A mice are not spontaneous bleeders. So therefore, we developed a protocol which is by needle stick injury of the articular cartilage joint. And you can see here that when you injure these joints, they result in hemorrhage and erythematous swelling. And we also followed a scoring system whereby we validated this hemophilic arthropathy by means of studying uh, the synovial cell hyperplasia, the RBC deposition, villus formation, cartilage erosion, as well as the hemosiderin deposition. And you can see the injured joints had substantially higher scores. And uh, because gene expression analysis was involved, this is almost 10 years back. So we did subject our samples, the RNA collected from the injured joints, and try to understand what is happening at the molecular level. What we identified was the transcription factor NF kappa B, which is the prime mediator of inflammation and immune response, was upregulated after a single articular bleed. And when we further followed this up, we could see within the first day, NF kappa B and different subunits of NF kappa B, as well as their target genes, which is the pro inflammatory cytokines, interleukin 6 and TNF alpha, were substantially uh, upregulated during acute hemothrosis, which is a single bleeding episode. And over uh, uh, chronic hemothrosis, which is when you have multiple bleeds, up to four bleeds over a span of uh, a month, these mouse models also showed elevated levels of hypoxia inducible factor and vascular endothelial growth factor. I'm cutting a lot of details here for the sake of clarity. And uh, after all this analysis, what we identified was this particular event. You have excess blood into the joint. Hemosiderin is deposited into the joint. Hemosiderin becomes a trigger for NF kappa B mediated events. And this NF kappa B activates either the pro inflammatory cascade or the pro angiogenic cascade mediated by VEGF. Then this leads to angiogenesis and neovascularization. And these vessels are very friable with uh, limited mobility. They break easily. Then it leads to bleeding. So this leads to a vicious cycle of bleeding, pro-inflammation, angiogenesis, and bleeding. Over a period of time, if this situation persists, it also leads to generation of matrix metalloproteinases within the articular cartilage, leading to cartilage degeneration. And in this process, we also identified small microRNAs that were dysregulated. And taking the example of one microRNA, which is 15B. And this 15B was substantially downregulated in the articular cartilage joint when there were multiple bleeds. So we wanted to understand what is it doing. So we developed a viral vector, which is AAV based to deliver them specifically into the articular cartilage joint. And then when we overexpress this microRNA 15B in hemophilia A mice that has hemophilic arthropathy, you could see that this was substantially reducing both VEGF and uh, potentially uh, the HIF uh, molecules. We have extended these studies to other types of uh, uh, small RNAs, including long non-coding RNA. For the interest of time, I'll not get into the details of this. What I can tell you is there is a cascade of small RNAs that are regulating multiple molecular mediators that can upregulate pro-inflammation as well as angiogenesis, along with the fact that they are able to upregulate chondrodegenerative degenerative enzymes. And we are working on this to convert them into a therapeutic by local intra-articular transfer of these molecules into the joint. And that's a work that is still ongoing. 
So what are we doing with respect to other diseases? Uh, just a very small example. I wasn't sure how many diseases should I focus here. So I thought of just focusing on LCA2, maybe a few slides on that. I've already talked to you about what LCA2 is. It's a, a, a retinitis pigmentosa and uh, multiple trials have tried to use AV vectors, but the uh, effect of therapy is short-lived. So what did we use? Some of these mutant viruses that I showed you in the context of hemophilia, we thought, okay, why not use this shell or the uh, core protein of the virus and try to deliver RPE65 as the therapeutic gene, particularly in mouse models. First of all, we wanted to know whether it works. So we did uh, intravitreal gene transfer and also subretinal gene transfer into murine eyes. And this was with the reporter viruses. And this is a fundus imaging of mouse eye. You can see that there is a clear expression of uh, the reported gene, in this case, GFP, in mice that received uh, uh, the uh, AAV2 mutant vectors. And this is the level of expression that you see uh, uh, with the unmodified vector. Again, five years of work went into this. And what I can tell you is, at the end, this is where we stand currently. This is the ERG done in a congenitally blind mouse because the RPE65 gene has been knocked out. And what we used was, this is untreated animal. So when you shine light on their eyes, you see no A wave and B wave, signifying that there is no phototransduction. And this is with the unmodified viruses, but containing the therapeutic gene, which is RPE65. You do see some level of AAV, which is a photoreceptor uh, response, but there is no ganglion cell uh, response. And with the modified vectors that we have used, you can see that there is a clear rescue of phenotype in mouse that have received RPE65 under the improved vector systems that we have developed. I'm just going to finish in maybe two minutes, if that is okay. Yeah, another two minutes are good, sir. Yes, ma'am. Now, what have we done with all of these things is uh, because I come from an uh, institute of technology, uh, technology development has been our forte. And I've talked to you about hemophilia. I've talked to you about LCA2 briefly. What we have also developed is multiple suicide gene therapy approaches for hepatocellular carcinoma, AML, acute myeloid leukemia, and certain lymphomas. And more recently, we have got a very, very interesting data in terms of Duchenne muscular dystrophy as well as diabetes. And of course, we have been trying to develop a consortium of IPs so that we can indigenously produce these vectors and probably knock off two or three zeros from the price that is currently available. And so price is a major issue, but the other initiative that we are also working on is in terms of uh, uh, education and outreach. Uh, I also serve the uh, American Society of Gene and Cell Therapy, and I chair one of their global outreach committees. And we have extended our help uh, either in terms of developing the national guidelines for gene therapy, even in India, as well as uh, uh, in terms of educating uh, educators, uh, basically uh, faculty uh, recently, just about a month back, this was in Tanzania. So we have developed outreach activities so uh, we can establish a consortium of members from multiple lower and middle income countries so that all of this can be translated at a cost which is acceptable to us. I remember whatever I'm going to show you has been shown here just a couple of months back. I was here, but uh, this is Sunday morning, so I wanted you to probably leave on a lighter note. Uh, you know this person. Any guess? Sachin Tendulkar. And as I said, you have seen this. Those who were here, some of you were here, you have seen this two months before. And sorry if this is boring. And when... Sachin Tendulkar was born in the year 1973. Gene therapy was still a concept. And when was he born? Any idea? April 24th. And Sachin Tendulkar made his debut in the year? 1989, right? And when he made his debut in uh, Pakistan, Michael Blees and colleagues were administering the gamma retroviral vector for severe combined immunodeficiency at the NIH. 1999 World Cup, uh, you all know that it happened in England and Wales. 
And uh, Sachin Tendulkar personally had a tragedy, that is, he lost his father, but two days later against Kenya, he blasted a 140 not out. So at this point of time, there was also a death in, in, in terms of Jesse Gilsinger, who was treated for ornithine carbamylase deficiency, and the FDA put a hold on on gene therapy trials in the US. 2011, when we won the World Cup in India, you had Amit Nathwani, who published this landmark paper in terms of gene therapy for hemophilia B using AAV8 vectors. 2013, when Sachin Tendulkar decided to hand his boots, and uh, when he retired, of course, he had a new hairdo, but we also had Unicure which was first approved by EMA. And this was for lipoprotein lipase deficiency that was approved in 2013. And now he has been the star for a long time, at least to this present generation. And But when he was uh, making it good from the year 2016 and 17 onwards, Luxterna, which is the first commercial gene therapy product for treating LCA2 came into the market. And this was marketed by Spark Therapeutics. We have many new kids in the block. They have a long way to go, but I hope we don't have to go a long way to make this as a standard of care. Thank you for your kind attention. Happy to take questions. And I would also like to thank Dr. Dinesh and Dr. Ruchi here. Uh, they have been uh, helping us for all our very recent hemophilia related gene therapy work from the perspective of uh, measuring the factor levels uh, in, in murine samples. Thank you once again.